Hi, Eli. Bob. How are you doing? I'm good. Here, I'm, I'm here at my, my Newsweek cubicle in Washington, D.C. In D. Washington. And you, are you in Princeton? In Washington, D.C. I'm in Princeton at Blobbing Head, Blobbing Head Central, yes. Very good. Very good. Okay. Iran, right? Yeah, we're going to talk about Iran. I mean, we, actually, this is a bait and switch on your part. I mean, a little bit. Twitter, well, we, we can you, talk you about Queen Esther. You me into a debate about, about my piece about Bibi's invocation of the Book of Esther. But we can, like, we can, but, let's, we can talk about that piece, because I, I had a specific... We, we can save that till the end, too. Or we could do it right, whenever, whenever you want. Why don't we uh, Why don't we save that for the end and um, start out just with General Iran talk? Because I kind of feel like we've hit a little bit of a plateau. You know, I think the last week things were very fluid. I mean, during Bibi's visit and so on, and then certain lines were kind of drawn. And then, you know, I mean, in terms of what Obama was and was not willing to say, what what his basically what his position was going to be going into negotiations i think he 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 sent some sent some signals about that and i think um and and now the negotiations are apparently actually going to happen that that also has solidified in the last week so i kind of my feeling is that at this point it's largely kind of wait and see until the negotiations start in april but maybe maybe you think things are more fluid still well, I have no faith in the negotiations. Um, well, of course not. But, well, but, not but, of course not. I just don't. I just your, don't think. That's your ideology. I don't think it's ideological. I just don't. I think that there's no evidence that. I mean, like if the Iranians clearly have CNN in in, in Tehran or BBC, and they they know that uh, when Gaddafi made the deal that we would hope they would make, um, mm -hmm. that. He became vulnerable when you know there was an uprising in his country, and he wanted to use you know horrible force to put it down. And uh, I think it would be cold comfort to the uh, current ruling crop of clerics to say, and various intelligence uh, you know generals and so forth to say, well, he only lost his legitimacy and sovereignty after uh, he tried to you know suppress you know a rebellion. Uh, using force, and uh, as long as you don't do something like that, then uh, you know the security guarantees in such a deal will remain. And uh, I just don't. So, so I feel that in some ways, uh, Obama's intervention in Libya. Uh, I don't know that that was the act that would have foreclosed such a deal because I think that the Iranians were quite determined to get a nuke as it is. But that would have been the, the last piece of evidence. So I don't think that there is much to talk about. Uh, with the Iranians, because I think that they know that that nuclear weapon is, um, you know, crucial to the survival of their regime. They have not just put a lot of prestige on it, and they know that... Wait, the nuclear weapon is crucial to the survival of the regime? Yeah. I think, I think maintenance of, of enrichment of a, of a nuclear program certainly is. I, I think they have to be able to, to tell their people that they have... Uh, that they've salvaged that, and that they've gotten the world to respect their right to enrich uranium and have a program, but I don't. Uh, I, I mean, so in terms of domestic, uh, you know, survival of the regime, are you no, saying no, no, that, I'm not saying domestic that, 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 that they need it for regional security? Yeah, they, need they, they need it for regional security because you think they actually need it, or they just think they need well, it? Well, I mean, listen, you could make the argument that Pakistan had a nuke, and the and and Obama, you know, ordered special forces in to kill Bin Laden. Okay, so. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's nothing that will happen. But I don't think right. that if, if Gaddafi had a nuclear weapon, there's no way mm -hmm. that NATO would have come to the aid of the rebels in Benghazi. If Assad had a nuclear weapon, mm -hmm. there's no way we would even be mm -hmm. having a conversation about coming to the aids of the rebels so, in his country. So you're saying that the, the, the bait, to the extent that there is a drive to get an actual nuclear weapon in Iran... You're seeing it as fundamentally for defensive purposes, not offensive purposes. Well, as I, I think we've, I don't know, I've been on blogging heads before. I, I can't tell you about the first strike or not first strike. I'm not confident that they would launch a first strike. In fact, I think it's, I can tell you. You want me, you want me to no, tell No, I think it's unlikely that they would do it. But I also okay. feel that if you're, if you're Israel, you can't take the risk on the 10% chance that they may uh well, no, I wouldn't take a risk on 10%, but the chances are way lower than that. And America's been taking that, took that risk throughout the Cold War and lived to tell about it. Well, I mean, and that kind of sets to an argument that I've seen on Twitter and on other things, and I just find that 
you know, if there was, if there was, if we had the detailed knowledge of Stalin's nuclear program in 1949 before he tested, uh, that we have of the Iranian program, um, that I just, you know, that a Soviet nuclear weapon probably, uh, you know, was an important factor as to why the West did not aid uh, the Hungarians in 1956. It probably is a reason why there was very little that was done to help uh, the Prague uprising in 1968, and it well, enabled a lot of bad there... things that were short of thermonuclear war, if you follow me. I, 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 is there evidence that that was part of Eisenhower's thinking? He was anti-intervention in general, you know. The French wanted him to get into Vietnam, and he said, no, thanks, and I don't think that was about fear of nuclear retaliation. Well, certainly uh, Eisenhower was anti-intervention, but the Radio Free Europe at the time encouraged the uprising, and at the end of the day, when there was a call whether or not you wanted to kind of have a game of brinksmanship no, with the yeah, Soviet I know Union, the, I, I'm not saying, and I'm not an expert in European history, but I think one of the key factors there was that the, yeah. you didn't want to risk this escalating into a uh, nuclear exchange. So, and that's so then you think it would have been better, I mean, given that we paid that price for them to having a nuclear weapon, the price of Hungary, you think it would have been better to invade and occupy the Soviet Union and make sure uh, they no, I would not, I'm not, I don't, well, first of all, who's talking about invading and occupying Iran? I mean, it was, that's, is that an option? Well, that's the only way to keep them from getting one. Yeah, I don't think, the bombing on, thing is, on. is only going to work for so long, Eli. Yeah, come on. Well, first of all, uh, there is a policy of delaying them getting a, a nuclear weapon. It's cyber attacks and uh, sabotage and modified equipment and things that I've written about before, and up to and including the assassination they, of scientists. And they've been doing as much of that as possible, yes. and yet everybody's saying they can have a weapon within a year. Okay, <laughs> so I'm saying that there are a series of things that are, are done in this, what I would call a shadow war against Iran's nuclear program. Second of all, um, the I don't know anybody who is called. I just moderated a debate at Foreign Policy Initiative, and the most hawkish person on that panel was Jamie Fly, who was the executive director. <laughs> well, there's a reason he was the most hawkish person on the panel because he's the most hawkish person in the world. All right. Well, but, all right. But, but, but know, I aside. He he wants to wait. Now, what he he wants to what bomb them into regime change? Well, I mean, he, he, he wants to bomb I, until I'm, the government falls. I, right. Jamie Fly can speak for himself, but when I said. Mm -hmm. If your if your plan to bomb regime targets in addition to nuclear targets does mm -hmm. not work and, and result in a regime change, and you're wrong, would you support an invasion? And I would consider him to be the closest to that position, and he said no. And so I, as I, I think all of the options, from bombing to even diplomacy, every option at this point is delay, and it's delay with the uh, with hopefully the idea in mind that at some point, uh, the regime will be displaced by something more democratic and, 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 and better and more decent and more, uh, more humane. And we saw maybe a glimmer uh, look, of that in 2009. What? But that's, I think, that's, that's the whole thing. So when people say, we don't want a repeat of another Iraq, the, on the anti-war side, I would say that that's hyping. That's a bit of fear mongering. I, I'm, I'm not saying there, there's a lot of support right now for an invasion. I'm just saying that as a matter of fact, the only way you could be sure that they were not developing a nuclear weapon I, in the wake of a bombing strike would be to invade and occupy because the, their their response to a bombing strike would be to to decentralize the whole operation they would they would have a lot of covert centrifuges all over the place and you you just wouldn't be able to do the job from the air again and you can say you would hope uh, for for uh, you know chain democratic change in time, the assumption being that a democratic Iran would behave very differently, and and that is certainly an untested assumption, and 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 arguably a naive yeah, one. I don't think it's naive. Um, but but the fact is, bombing cannot do the job. Bombing can delay, but I don't I I don't I, as I said, I will make this very clear. My position is. If you can continue to delay the program without bombing, then why mm -hmm. risk an open conflagration where you know that you expect them to do terrorism all over the world and, you, and whatnot? Uh, that said, I don't. Uh, that said, I don't think anybody has the precise intelligence, which is never, you know, rock solid. It's always the best guess, even though there are a lot of very impressive, uh, you know, cap capabilities that the United States and Israel and uh, European powers and uh, even some Arab powers have. But that said, I think you're only talking about delaying it. And as for your argument about, well, I mean, you're presuming that the Iranian program has been 
out in the open right now, and what, everything we know about it has been the result of uncovering uh, or sleuthing things that were hidden from the IAEA and underground, including the latest in Fordo, and before that, Natanz was, of course, the result of uh, the Iranians being outed initially by a um, uh, kind of cult slash opposition group known as the MEK, uh, which I've always suspected that they had some connection with the Israelis. But the point is, is that almost everything we already know about the Iranian to. program is the result of, th they've already been hiding it, they've already been doing that. It's already an, a huge intelligence challenge, a huge intelligence target. And so that would continue after the bombing. But to say that, okay, well, yeah, they've been like out in the open and now they're not, it's, you know. No, but there's a difference between having one hidden deep underground facility, which if exposed blows your whole plan, and having uh, centrifu centrifuges distributed all well, over but the place. I, I, don't, I don't know that that's, A, not the case now, that they don't have a, a parallel program. Exactly. And B, we don't well, know that. right, okay, right. And B, that, you know, over time with, you know, I mean, over, you know, further intelligence, you could find out where they are and then try to screw them up as well. I'm just saying that this is a constant struggle, usually done in the shadows, to right. uncover and sleuth out elements of the Iranian program to say that, uh, to, to act as if up to this point they've been above board or restrained or anything like that, I think is uh, it's not it's not exactly right. I mean, I should be clear. I don't think we have the right to bomb them anyway. But okay. um, you know, uh, they they if, if they declared you know a month from now that they were leaving the NPT and then a year later they had a bomb, they would have exactly the status in international law that Israel has, that Pakistan has, that well, India actually, has. That's we're, not not we're not bombing them. Uh, if they were to do that, they would be violating the NPT and all those other countries that you just said are not signatories to the NPT. Well, no, you're allowed to just you're allowed to just leave the NPT. Yeah, but if you do that, then you kind of are breaking... I mean, I think that would destroy the NPT. No, no, it, no, no. The treaty itself spells out the terms under which you're sure, allowed you're to... Sure, you're, you're allowed to leave, leave the NPT. However, right. if it's, it's, it happened once with North Korea, and I would say that the NPT kind of barely survived, but we managed it. If, if Iran was to leave the NPT, was to break out, as you say, then, mm -hmm. then I think it would, A, cause a proliferation cascade effect where other NPT members would soon... And you would see the treaty very, very quickly dissolve, uh, would become far weaker. And the treaty itself and the whole NPT regime that was sort of, that, that Johnson uh, very much wanted to sort of start after the Chinese got a nuke and to try to kind of control all this technology would be in tatters. And that Iran has that capability to do that. That's just uh, the horror, the proliferation horror of them uh, obtaining a nuke. Um, well, I, I would say, I would say, you know, if you're saying that that would uh, that that would stimulate proliferation, I would say the same thing about what uh, India, Pakistan, and Israel have done. But it hasn't. In their own, I mean, it's just as bad for a bunch of countries to develop nuclear weapons because they never joined the treaty as for a bunch of countries to develop nuclear weapons after leaving the treaty. Well, they, they so didn't those, leave the treaty. I don't, they I don't never consider signed. them. Bob, really they never signed citizens. the treaty. They never saw. I know they didn't, but I'm just saying. And also, by that, the way, uh, I can say on Israel. Israel's had a nuclear weapon uh, since. Uh, the Beatles Abbey Road, and um, the 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 and every every Arab state knows it, and yet we don't see Egypt and Saudi Arabia and the UAE, who certainly and Turkey, who have the uh, means mm -hmm. to try to do that. Why don't they do that? And I think one reason is because the the Israelis do not have a policy of uh, deliberate ambiguity, where they do not ever acknowledge that they have, or at least that they sort of acknowledge it a couple well, times, but that was a flub. So they don't acknowledge that they have it, and they don't, uh, and, and, and there isn't a situation in which people are worried about if the Iranians do get a nuke, where you would see uh, an open, uh, a country with an open nuclear weapon, and then making the kind of horrific threats that the Iranians, of course, make all the time anyway. So it's, it's, it ought to tell you something, that the Israelis have had a nuclear weapon since the Beatles broke up. And mm -hmm. no Arab state has significantly pursued one. You know what that up. tells me? That tells me that if Iran gets one, that may not stimulate uh, a, a proliferation contagion either. Well, Bob, right? I mean, you, it, your it, opinion it, is, is, is uh, the no. Saudis have pretty much said they would they would pursue one. Of course they've said it. Just the way Bibi is every oh is always saying he's going to bomb next week because the Saudis, like Bibi, would rather that we took care of the problem. But but I don't I don't take their word for that. Well. I, I would say that, you know, the best estimates from, you know, 
I think, open intelligence sources, but I know the National Intelligence Council a few years ago did a survey of countries, and it's, and it's widely, and Obama himself has said this, that he expects mm -hmm. there really would be this proliferation effect. Mm -hmm. And I, again, well, ask you, do you, ex do you think that the Iranians would be, uh, would be willing to take the Israeli posture, which is to never acknowledge that they have a nuke, to never use threats in terms of their, that they have a nuke or anything like that, or do you think it's more likely, given the past behavior of the Iranians, that they would use their, the fact that they had a nuke as yet another instrument of terror uh, in their, in their, in their... Actually, I think the former, especially given that the Supreme Leader said about a week ago that it would be a sin to have nuclear weapons, I don't imagine him announcing, you know, anytime soon, we've got nuclear weapons. They've said that again and again, that it's against Islam and so on. I don't imagine them declaring that they've got a nuclear weapon. No, I, I'm not sure it really matters, but, you know, in terms of how threatened neighbors feel anyway, but as a matter of fact, no. I, I, I mean, y yes, I expect them to maintain a policy of ambiguity. So you think that the Iranians would have a, uh, the position of strategic ambiguity uh, similar to the Israelis? Well, that's unexpected. I don't think that, that they, I don't think it's, that's, that's the case. And I think that actually if you look at the bulk of the things that the Iranians say, yes, you occasionally have these statements from the Supreme Leader, but I think it's, that's, that's pretty much for, those, those statements really are for a certain kind of Western audience that uh, is minimizing it. But I think that the Iranians would like to have the nuclear um, insurance policy, if you will, that would bolster their already massively destabilizing uh, activities in the region. Everyone. What's an example? What's an example of something aggressive that they could do in the region if they had nuclear weapons that they can't do now? Well, they do so many terrible things right now. But I'm what well, I'm saying one. is that is that if, if that is it. Do you think that there would be more or less likely to support? organizations and terrorist groups that oppose the peace process, for example. That's that's a big one that they do. How would nuclear weapons, how would nuclear weapons in, a, uh, in Iran's hands, uh, and by the way, Hamas has or just recently said they would not take Iran's side in a, in, in a war, but, but anyway, how would nuclear weapons uh, in Iran's hands enable Hezbollah to be more aggressive toward uh, Israel, what's the exact scenario you imagine? Well, if another rocket war starts up and then they use, and then they, they use. And you, okay, so they start launching rockets into Israel, and you're saying Israel doesn't retaliate? They don't take out the, the missile launchers? Let's say, let's, they say they do, let's say they do retaliate. And then let's okay, say, like, a week and a half into it, the Iranians say there will be, you know, grave consequences if you continue to do it. And at that point, I, at that point, to take that at that point Bob Wright, I don't know what the answer would be. Some people say that the Israelis would, would, would kick Hezbollah even harder in the teeth in order to show that the Iranians cannot use their nuclear umbrella to, uh, you know, allow this sort of stuff to happen. However, maybe they don't. And that's the other thing. And I bet you dollars to donuts that you and your pals on the pacifist left will say, don't, don't disturb Iran once they have nukes because they could use it and you don't want to start a nuclear war. And we Let's have to just, kind of no, come to terms with Don't change the subject. So. Don't change the subject, Eli. We're doing this. Yeah, we're we looking are. at a yeah. scenario. Let's play it out, yes. okay? okay? Okay, so um, a week and a half in, Iran starts making rumbling noises. Yeah. There's no way Israel is going to cease and desist if it thinks it, that it's in its vital interest to take out Hezbollah's infrastructure and missiles. And the reason is... Because they know for sure what you know and I know, which is that Iran would be bluffing. Because a nuclear attack on Israel would be literal suicide. And so that's not, you know, uh, Israel is not going to be deterred by that. Yeah, idea. I don't know about good that. Reason. I, I think it's a lot more. Oh, I think, think it, Israel I would think just sit there and I'm saying missiles I, and Tel Aviv. I don't, I'm saying that it's a far more. It's a. I don't. In the, in the fog of war and in a situation like that where you have that threat on the table and you have all kinds of calculations, it's not as cut and dry as you kind of speculate from your perch at Princeton University. And the reason that the Israelis are so concerned about it is because precisely they do think that they would have to face a potential horrible choice so that there would be a kind of um, empowerment. Now, if Hezbollah was to launch a chemical weapon and it was to explode then I think that that would that would that would trigger a response, even if the Iranians said that. But I think that they would try to go up to a certain Eli, limit. Eli, if if you're imagining a scenario yeah. 
where Hezbollah is launching, you know, conventional missiles into Tel Aviv day after day, and Israel is just sitting there for fear that if they retaliate, Iran will nip them, I think you are in another universe. I'm you saying that, that I think you it's very that likely that the Iranians would make the threat. And if they made so the what? threat, you then they have to... You know Israel is not going to sit there and take it. Okay. And you, and then you know that, that, that Iran is not going to deliver on the threat. And Iran knows all this, too, which is why they'd probably be smart enough not to make the threat anyway. But, you know, let's turn it around. I mean, what good have nuclear weapons done for, for Israel? Who is it who, 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 who refrains from attacking Israel for fear of nuclear retaliation? That doesn't seem to stop Hezbollah, Hamas... You know, because nobody, nobody, uh, a nuclear threat is the least credible threat I, I gotta in the world. I got to tell you, I got to tell, 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 tell you something. Weapons. This is bullshit. I'm just going to come out and say it's bullshit. During the Cold War. Okay, you're on the record. I'm on the record. I think your line of reasoning is total bullshit. Because during the, during the Cold War, there are mm -hmm. always these moments where you have potential miscalculation. The most classic example uh, is uh, the 11 days in what, November or whatever, when you had... Uh, the crisis in the Kennedy administration. And mm -hmm. I'm saying that there are human beings in these organizations. Do you expect that there's going to be a hotline between Tel Aviv and Tehran or Jerusalem and Tehran where they're going to know and they're going to set all these things up? Or is it more likely that there's going to be potential for a misunderstanding? And that's the reason why people don't want nuclear weapons in the hands of lots of states. And you're going to, with an Iranian nuke, you're going to basically magnify all that. So sitting here and saying, okay. well, they would never do it because rationally, of course, they don't want to commit suicide. And okay. that therefore, and what I'm saying is that if they make the threat and they have to have this, this, this calculation that we don't know what happens. And there's all these potential miscalculations during the Cold War, well, and which, you, you know, thank God it didn't happen. Abstractly, you, can, you can say abstractly that you're concerned about miscalculations. Well, I think you're just as abstract. Really like you're to just hear as abstract a specific too. scenario where it's credible that Israel would be deterred from defending itself because Iran had a nuke. And I don't think you can come up with that. I think the Iranians would go out of their way to make it seem that it was likely that if they had this nuke, they would be crazy enough to use it. Because that is, in, in classic deterrence theory, it is an advantage mm -hmm. to do that. And by the way, they're already pretty good. They're, they're pretty good at convincing people that they're crazy terrorists, lunatics, who and then filled with hate for Jews and Westerners. They're, they're good at convincing you. Well, um, I'm just saying that, that, I'm I'm just not, saying I'm that not, they're I'm already not, there. Not, so I'm saying that the question is, when you have that decision, and they, if they make that threat, and then there's a potential for, this, for these miscalculations, which is why everybody is for, or most people are for, non-proliferation, keeping nuclear weapons out of the hands of as many states as possible. Oh, I'm for non-proliferation at a reasonable cost. Okay. Um... You know, and, and in fact, I think if this thing uh, forces us to to come to terms with how deficient the non-proliferation regime is, uh, and think in radically new ways, that would be wonderful. I'd like to talk about a, a nuclear weapons-free Middle East. Oh, I bet I, you how, how would you like that? Where nobody in the Middle East has nuclear weapons. Okay. Would you like that? Uh, one day there could be a nuclear weapons-free Middle East. Okay, well, I'd, I'd like to start talking them. about it, and 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 I'd like. And possibly an agreement to move in that direction could be part of uh, a solution to this problem. Uh, well, are you proposing that Obama pressure Israel to disclose and then disarm its nuclear program in exchange for Iran doing the same? Uh, well, no. I, I, I'm proposing something like uh, a deal where uh, Israel acknowledges having nuclear weapons, says it's not going to, you know, that so long as the deal holds, uh, part of the deal is Iran won't develop nuclear weapons, submits to intrusive inspections, and Israel says, well, okay, we're not going to build any more nuclear weapons. We're going to open our, our, uh, our reactor uh, and so on up to inspection so that the, that the international community can validate that we're not making any more nuclear weapons. After a year of this, we will actually decommission 10 nuclear weapons and blah, blah, blah. So we will start taking steps toward a nuclear-free Middle East, and you would spell it all out, how it's going to work and what other nations are part of it. Um, I'm saying that would be a worthwhile deal from Israel's point of view if Israel is indeed as concerned as it says about an Iranian uh, nuclear weapon. Well, I've actually, I actually wrote Pro about the war. potentially that kind of deal in 2009 uh, for the Washington Times in a couple stories. 
when I was at that newspaper. And, uh, I mean, listen, there are some Israeli academics who talk about it. My understanding is that there is a theory called what's called the Long Corridor, and it's, you know, because the Israelis don't acknowledge their nuclear program at all, or their nuclear weapon, and that, um, you know, there are a series of things that would have to happen in the Middle East, including the disarmament of chemical and biological and other uh, weapons from its neighbors, and there would have to be, I guess, a kind of peace process. And I'm not an expert on all this stuff, and I've actually been told by other Israeli officials recently that this idea of what's called the long corridor for disarmament is something that nobody actually, it's, that's not, it's only academics believe it. So I'm try, I, I don't want to get too far out of what I know, but I have heard okay. the sort of scenarios under which the Israelis would acknowledge and disarm, as you say. But that strikes me as a long way away. But I, I, I would also point out that, you know, there is something else here that I think is, is important, which is that um, the reason to oppose an Iranian nuke more than other nukes is because of the nature of the regime itself. And that kind of gets us, I think, a little bit into uh, what I found objectionable about your um, your post on, on Netanyahu's, uh, uh, you know, giving the, the Megillah to uh, on, on, yeah, Obama, on, on which, which is that like, yes. I just feel that, you know, another consequence of an Iranian nuke is that, you know, if there's another uprising uh, in Iran, and I hope there is one, that there will be very little that the outside world can actually do uh, to advantage them. Well, were you advocating intervention last time, military intervention from the outside? Well, I don't know. I don't I, know if I, I, do I would agree. say like military agree. intervention. What I'm saying is that there's very little. It's 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 it, that it has the effect of cementing in place a regime that is pretty awful for a lot of different reasons, and it's not just. Israel, although Israel is a huge, you know, it's obviously Israel kind of gets involved with it. But I mean, and that there's, and I would just point something else out. It's it's not just Israel. It's like it's you know the, our allies, America's allies in the Gulf, have um, quietly pushed for economic isolation and pressure on Iran uh, because they are very worried about um, an Iranian nuke as well. And when I asked this of Ambassador Otaiba a few years ago at the Aspen Ideas Festival, uh, which I'm sure you'll be attending now that you're at the Atlantic Bob, um, about, well, you know, what would you, what, I mean, as, as much as you don't want to see uh, a strike on Iran's nuclear program, would you rather live with an Iranian nuke? And his response was absolutely not. I would, if it came to that, I would, he would support um, a, um, a strike in that, in that regard. And that, that, as we know from WikiLeaks cables as well, that's pretty much the attitude of a lot of America's Arab allies as well on this question. And um, I think it's because of the nature of the regime, the fact that they support uh, terrorist groups, the fact that the Iranians are like, you know, a very much of a destabilizing force. Well, it definitely is enmity with a lot of between Iran and a lot of uh, Arab think states. Think about the perspective of Bahrain, a country that at times, you know, Iranian leaders have said is a province of Iran. And what would an Iranian nuke mean to them? Would that so if Iran? pursues and sort of amped up its other things, right? If it, let's say it decides mm -hmm. it's going to invade Bahrain or come to the rescue of the Shia majority population in Bahrain, who, by the way, have a lot of legitimate grievances that uh, the monarchy should do more to address there. So I'm not necessarily, but let's say that the Iranians decide they want to get involved in a serious military way. And Iran with nukes makes that a much harder and more difficult scenario. Wait, we're talking Syria now? No, no, I'm talking about yeah. Bahrain. I'm talking about Iran. Oh, you said in a serious way. I'm sorry. So, um, yeah. Well, I mean, look, Iran hasn't invaded a country since, like, the Book of Esther was written, okay? Uh, you know, it's not characteristic behavior if you're, if you're worried about uh, them, uh, you know, using nuclear weapons as, as an umbrella for that kind of activity, leaving aside the question of how effective the nukes would be. Um, so I think you're working pretty hard now. I don't think so. I think the Iranians up. have been incredibly aggressive, and while they don't formally invade countries the way that uh, right. the United States does, for example. But they, they, they conduct most of their uh, foreign policy through supporting terrorist groups and, and other sorts of means like that by you know, supporting groups that, that, that attack uh, civilians. So it's a little bit misleading to say they haven't, they haven't invaded anybody's book of Esther because it makes it seem like the Iranians are not, especially this particular regime, are uh, somehow content to you know focus on their own knitting, which is not true. They support 
Islamic revolution all over the region. In fact, you know, recently I was just in Somalia, and, uh, you know, the, the UN monitors have found the Iranians are supporting, like, al-Shabaab in Somalia. What possible reason would they have to do something like that? Well, you know, that's bad. I can't imagine anything we would do to counteract that that would be deterred by Iran's having nuclear weapons. But Well, I, I um, just... Can you, can you understand how, you know, I agree with you that it's, 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 not, uh, it's not realistic to say that the Iranians are suicidal and would, you know, welcome a nuclear Good. exchange. I don't think that's right. Good. I don't think that's a correct reading of... You can also see how an, Iranian, uh, how an Iranian nuke would empower what is already a kind of cascade of terrible behavior. Well, that's just a vague assertion. It How is that a empower. vague assertion? That, this is all the stuff that they're doing now. If they get a nuke, they're more powerful, and they're harder to deter. That, that's just an assertion. I mean, to, you know, to back it up, I, I'm not saying there would be no sense in which they didn't carry a little more weight, but I'm saying if you can't give me a specific compelling scenario where, where something would actually happen and it would actually matter, I'm, I'm going to reserve, you know, endorsement of your fears. Um, but, But... Let's look. We've done this for. This is now thirty minutes. Do you want to talk about a little about uh, Esther? Well, I found. You know, I, I, why don't you kind of restate the argument? Okay. So, so Bibi Netanyahu gave Obama uh, a copy of the book of uh, Esther. It so happened that that his visit coincided with the uh, the Jewish holiday of is it Purim or Purim? How do you Purim. say it? Purim. Purim. And. Uh, and, and, and that is all about the Book of Esther, uh, which, which describes a time when um, the Persian government, uh, you have to be careful here, because it wasn't so much the king's initiative as his prime minister's, and the prime minister, I gather, wasn't actually Persian. But anyway, the Persian government tried to wipe out uh, all the Jews in the Persian Empire, failed, uh, the... Um, uh, and the Jews prevailed, uh, and then, for good measure, killed 75,000 Persians. Okay, so, um, the, uh, Obama gave, uh, or Netanyahu gave Obama a copy of the Book of Esther, uh, and, and said to Obama, according to Haaretz, then, too, they wanted to wipe us out. Okay, right. meaning, you know, these Iranians have just always hated us. And I just found that really offensive and gross. And then he, he underscored it uh, in, in his speech before AIPAC, where he said, he said Esther is a story of a Persian anti-Semite who tried to annihilate the Jewish people. I think that's actually factually wrong, because I think the instigator of the plot to wipe them out was the prime minister, whose name... Uh, Haman. I've got somewhere here. Haman or Haman, Haman or something? It's Haman. Yeah, and I don't think he was Persian, actually. Oh, but, no, I think he was ethnically from some other, uh, he, he, was, he was in the service of the Persian Empire, but, a num but commenters, and actually and a rabbi who commented on my post, said, not that this contradicted anything I had said, but said, I think that uh, Haman is actually not ethnically Persian. So anyway, but anyway, it really, I, I thought this was really gross, and I, and I said that, first of all, if... If a Muslim said, pointed to something in the Quran as evidence that Jews have always hated Muslims, and there are things you could point to in a way that's somewhat analogous to what Netanyahu did here, um, and said, see, Jews have always hated us, I think, you know, we'd say, oh, come on, you know, you're really, this is, this is, this is, you're looking pretty hard for reasons to keep hating Jews, aren't you here? I mean, this is ridiculous to look back, you know, you know into ancient history and see a scriptural reference to some antagonism and take that as a sign that this ethnic group will eternally harbor hostility towards you. That's just kind of nuts. And I just think beyond that, Netanyahu is using the power of Scripture in speaking to his audience. Um, he's using Scripture to foment belligerence. And uh, that I just and when, when Muslims do it, we condemn it. And I think when he does it, we should condemn it. And I condemn it. You're way off. Um, okay, tell me, tell me. Well, first of all, he was speaking of the government at the time, granted, thousands of years ago. And are you in any way disputing that the Iranian leadership is anti-Semitic? Are you saying that's, that's a smear of the Iranian leadership? 
Now, they've definitely said anti-Semitic things. What I'm taking issue with is him saying, then, too, they wanted to wipe us out, as if anti-Semitism is, is like in the genes of Persians. And I think he's uh, saying, then, too, the regime wanted I mean, like, the story... By the way, no, no, like, no, the, the, says, the, there's, there's the, 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 the Purim story has righteous Persians who are ending up right. helping the Jews. So but he chose I, I, not I don't, to highlight that. But, but he chose not but, to highlight well, that either, before either APAC or Obama. Well, much like the, you know, government of Haman, the government, the current government of Iran are, you know, self-proclaimed haters of Jews and also have at least expressed the desire to, you know, wipe off what they consider to be a cancer uh, in Israel off the map. And uh, they say this all the time and their their official media their, uh, you know, and, and, and on and on it goes. In fact, I think one of the founding tenets of the Islamic Revolution in Iran and one of their sort of principal, the founding principles is, the, is, is, is to resist the uh, Jewish state. And so I think that the um, analogy of the government at the time in the story of Purim and at the time in uh, the government in charge of Iran uh, is accurate, and I thought, that, and that's how I understood what he was saying, that, that these are the parallels. Now, on the other point about, like, well, it's probably not such a great idea to make reference to Scripture and current affairs as if, you know, things are kind of happening like they did in the Bible and we're approaching the end times. Mm -hmm. I join you as an avowed secularist. I don't like it. But I did not think that it's comparable to Muslim leaders who have at times quoted uh you know, the Quran and in and Muslim leaders at times quote the protocols of the elders of Zion. I'm thinking of the former president of uh, Malaysia uh, and other anti Semitic tracts. And that there's a much bigger problem in the Islamic world yeah, of yeah, like the different. industry but, but, of anti Semitism than there would be in like the Jewish world, <clears throat> I guess. But do this thought experiment. Yeah. If a Muslim pointed to the Quranic reference to the Jewish tribe in Medina right. that supposedly sided with Muhammad's enemies in Mecca. Yeah. If a Muslim pointed to that and said, see, the Jews, the Jews wanted to wipe us out, the then too. Now, Eli, let me finish. Right. And said, then, see, the Jews wanted to wipe us out, then too. What would your response be? Yeah, that's some, that's some solid logic, buddy. Is that what you'd say? I, I just don't see it. I think he's talking about... In the story Eli, of, would you please answer the question? What would you say if a Muslim said that? If a Muslim, it, it's not comparable. Because in one story, it's like the Jews of Medina. In another story, it's the government of Persia. I just don't, it, it's like, how are you, well, you no, don't, this was you, the leadership you understand? Of the, tribe, the, whole, the whole tribe, in fact, all three tribes in Medina, Jewish tribes, were supposedly antagonistic. Tribes have, in effect, governments. It was the regime. It was, it was the same thing. I think that Netanyahu was saying that there was a plot to kill all the Jews, which there was in ancient Persia, and that there's currently a government in Iran that would like to destroy the, the world's only Jewish state. And that, that's what he, was, he meant by it. And I don't, think, that that's I don't think it's comparable. I don't think it's comparable to... Uh, your defense... Your defense of him is based on the idea that he was talking about the regime, the government. Those yeah. are two words he actually never mentioned. He said to Obama, then too, they wanted to wipe us out. And to AIPAC, he said it's the story of a Persian anti-Semite. He doesn't mention the government or the regime. Both of them, both of those formulations underscore the ethnic connection to modern-day Iranians. So I'm afraid that what Bibi said just isn't consistent with your defense of him. Yeah, no, Heyman was a government official, though. He was a Persian. Yeah, but B he didn't, didn't say all B the Persians. He didn't say the Persian people. He didn't say that. He said a Persian, he meaning he said, a Heyman. He said, Eli, he said, then, too, they wanted to wipe us out. Yeah, I, anyway, we're, I think we're going to go round and round. I interpreted that as just simply meaning that the, uh, the, the Persian government at the time wanted to wipe them out. And I think you're just... So like it's like, we, and the other thing is, is that the story of Purim is like a defensive action, and the story of like you know where they try to, you know, remember in the end, like you know, Muhammad wins, uh, you know, well, in against the, end, the, the Jews. Jews. Win in this story, the Jews they do win, win in the end of the story, end. but they it was it's it's like I don't think that the two stories are are that comparable, and you People know, people always cast their offense as defense. I, I guess mean, the, here's the, the other thing. Here's the the Islamic thing. tradition is that the Jews pose a threat to Muhammad and Medina. Jewish tradition is that these Persians posed a threat to, to the Jews before they killed all the no, Persians. The Jewish tradition is that's that the way Persian, people talk. 
Abarat posed a threat, and the Persian regime, and there are other righteous Persians in the story. Well, are just, there righteous the Jews in the, in the Hadith the, that you're talking about? I don't know. I'm not a I'm just saying the defensive, the defensive aspect is, does not distinguish between the two cases I'm talking about. Both of them are cast and as I might add, I might add the that there's defense. far more examples of the Quran being used to incite anti-Semitism in the Islamic world than anything approaching that in uh, what might be called the Hebrew media or the wider Western media. Well, this is this is this is subtler than some of the things you're thinking of, I'm sure, and, and qualitatively different from some of them. But I would say, you know, I'm sure Netanyahu knows. I mean, you know who John Hagee is, right? I do know who John Hagee is. And what's the name of his organization? His his uh, Zion, his Christian Zionist it's organization. Kufi, Christians United for Israel. Okay. Well, he has written a book saying that uh, that, that sold 500,000 copies or something, saying that the book of Esther, <clears throat> um, you know, foretells. And confirm, you know, a, a, a modern day invasion of Iran and validates a modern day invasion of Iran. And Bibi Netanyahu knows damn well when he stands up in front of AIPAC and talks about the Book of Esther and a Persian anti Semite, he knows damn well that that is going to reach John Hagee's audience, which is under this like delusion uh, that the Bible mandates uh, invading Iran. So he knows what he's fooling around with. As I said, I don't think that scripture should be invoked for geopolitics. In that, we are in agreement. Okay. And my, my, what would tick me off a little bit about, or what, what, I, what really kind of hit me in a weird way about that post was that I just don't think that the two things are comparable. I mean, I lived in Cairo for a year, and I saw it how, you know, it was very commonplace to kind of stoke constantly what would have to be called, you know, these ancient anti-Semitic hatreds. And we see it, you know, in so many examples. And it's not limited to heads of state of places like Malaysia or Iran. It's also in, you know, media, and it's like over and over again. And it's something of a kind of media industry in a way that I don't think is comparable. Now, as, as for John Hagee, I, I don't like when Christians are get all end times -y about Israel. And that's that to me, I mean, like, and I think a better question to ask on that as far as the kind of John Hagees of the world go, is that, you know, if you had an Israeli leader who was prepared to sign a peace agreement with the Palestinians and to give up land that is mentioned in the Old Testament as belonging mm -hmm. to the Jews, would then, you know, these this, this group of people who are such supporters of Israel in the United States then lobby against the peace process? Because certainly I would say that my, my thinking is that the pro-Israel community would probably support that if an Israeli prime minister had a deal that he felt he was going to do, and that, and so forth. And then, so then, what would happen to the support? And that's a that's a much different kind of question. But that's a that that is where I think the danger is in the Hagee world. But then, like I just don't think that you can say that anything exists in the West that's comparable as a kind of anti-Persian or anti. Uh, Arab or anti-Muslim sentiment that's comparable to the kind of anti-Semitism that's deliberately stoked in uh, the Muslim and Arab world. Uh, I think that is true, basically. Okay. That that, that I, in terms of scale and, and some qualitative dimensions, probably they're not comparable. I, I'm just saying that that there's something in what Bibi Netanyahu is doing that we would condemn in another context. All right. I mean, you know what? I didn't really read it that way. I thought he was talking about the story payment when I celebrated Purim as a child and uh, an adult, uh, we, it was all focused on Haman. And Haman was the bad actor. And if you remember, the king, Ahasuerus, was, uh, right. the, uh, was persuaded by Queen Esther. And so it was right. the story of Purim itself as righteous and... Well, that's my, my point, is that, is that, you know, Netanyahu could just as well, it's not my only point, but he could just as well have said... Instead of it's the story of a Persian anti-Semite, period, which is, <laughs> he could have said it's a story of how ultimately Persians and Jews worked out their difficulties and came together. He could have said that, but no, because he wants a war, and it's that simple. Well, all right, now the, now let's let's this is this is a good place to end. Okay, this is the part where I really, I really think I, I disagree with you. I think that discussing Netanyahu and Israel in terms of wanting a war a war mm -hmm. of choice, seeking a war, is to forget the other actor in this play, which is Iran. It's to ignore the fact that we talked about before, how all these Arab allies also want to do 
quite dramatic things from the perspective of Saudi Arabia to try to prevent the Iranians uh, from acquiring a nuclear weapon. And finally, mm -hmm. it ignores the fact that in many ways, Iran is already, and the West is already, at war with Iran, and Iran is already at war with the West. There's an economic war, there's an intelligence war, there's a cyber war, there's also, uh, a, a, you know, a, a very much of a political war. And, and I would, and I, and, and, and to make this about Israel seeking the war with Iran, when Israel is, I think, acting very rationally to take the threat of a, of a regime like this seriously and to try to prevent it from getting a nuclear weapon, is to mm -hmm. significantly miss the picture. The Iranians well, are doing a lot in this war. They have supported war themselves. Mm -hmm. what, what, when I say he wants a war, I mean he wants a war given what he sees as the alternatives to war. He seems to think, well, I don't know what he thinks. He, 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 uh, he, he, see, he either thinks that there's no way a negotiated solution could work, um, or he thinks something else that leads him to want war but but he is he is acting as if uh an al alternative to war in effect does not exist because he has demanded preconditions for negotiation that would totally doom negotiations he's demanded that iran suspend uranium en enrichment before the negotiations start let alone that he's also insisting they not be allowed to, en to enrich uranium at all after the negotiations so his view you know, he seems to be uh, wanting to rule out all the options other than war, so far as I can tell. I think it's naive at this point. I mean, listen, Obama came into office. A lot of people said the reason why we didn't have an understanding or an agreement with Iran was because of pig-headed neocons in the Bush administration. So mm -hmm. Obama announced, you know, I want to negotiate without any preconditions. I want to negotiate. Uh, he, he, he did a series of things to try to get the Iranians to come to the table. And the Iranians, I remember this, Khamenei gave a speech after his big no ruse message to the people of Iran, denouncing uh, Barack Obama and saying, please have non-Zionists translate my words. And this has been the behavior of Iran. They, 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 what did they do in 2009 and 2010? As this administration announced that the U.S. was leaving Iraq, they stepped up their attacks on, on American soldiers. They stepped up their, their influence and so forth.